Hey, Dan Passarelli here. Welcome, welcome to today's class, Tips to Avoid the Most Common Option Trading Mistakes. <clears throat> now, before we get started, I need to point out options are not for everyone. You should read Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options Before Trading. Get a copy of that by emailing investorservices at the OCC.com. Now, if you're not familiar with me or who I am, what I do, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dan Passarelli. I am an author of two popular option trading books, Trading Option Greeks and the Market Taker's Edge. I'm a trader and have been for a long time. I was a professional trader on the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange for many years. Now I trade for myself in my personal account. And I am the founder and CEO and president of Market Taker Mentoring, the leader, the global leader in option trader education. <clears throat> and I'm a trading industry collaborator. I am invited to do classes for many, many organizations, top options brokerage firms here like First Trade, as well as uh, options exchanges, um, and options industry groups. And I'm a family man, uh, married to my wife, Kathleen, my two kids, Sam and Isabel, who are grown, and uh, my two little dogs, Yorkie and Amorkie. And outside of trading, I do other stuff too. I'm a runner, uh, a foodie, tr uh, world traveler, been all over the world, uh, either through, through Market Taker or with my family. And uh, also, I really enjoy music, both playing it and listening to it. Now, before we move forward here, <clears throat> hey, what's up, Jesus? Back again, my friend. Excellent. Now, before we get started, I want to uh, help you as much as I can during today's training but also going forward. And so I invite you to join free our um, our community. And you can do that by going to markettaker.com, two T's in a row, markettaker.com. And we've got lots of free classes there, really great for people who are brand new to option trading, but also a lot of more advanced tools for experienced traders as well as the MTM community chat room, which is a tremendous resource. So yeah, go to marketticker.com, click join free. We actually have a, a training coming up next week on zero DTE options, which I think you'll really, really enjoy, especially if you're pretty experienced. But now let's get into today's topic. So today we're gonna talk about tips to avoid common option trading mistakes. Because you know what? Look, here's the thing. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. I mean, I've been in the options world for over 30 years, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't make as many mistakes as I did when I first started. Uh, don't make as many as I did 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago or last year, but everybody is subject to mistakes. <clears throat> and one thing I can promise you is that having done this for 30 years and having had a successful trading career and being able to do all these things that I talked about on that previous slide, uh, one thing I can tell you is that I've made more mistakes than you will ever make trades. Uh <laughs> which is just basically a numbers game because as a professional trader, you make a lot of trades and you're going to goof a couple of them up. So that said, I get to shorten your learning curve by sharing with you the mistakes that I made so that you don't have to make them. Because there's a number of challenges to option trade. The first one is forecasting the market. <clears throat> Uh, on the one hand, if we all had a crystal ball and could forecast the market with 100% certainty, my oh my, couldn't we be really, really successful trading? Uh, of course we could. 
though I would contend that you don't necessarily have to be right as an option trader. In fact, that's not really at all what it's about. It's more about managing uncertainty and taking money out of the market uh, as opposed to predicting the future accurately all the time. And the deeper you go into options education, the more you appreciate that fact. Because as traders, nobody just decides one day, you know what, I'm going to be an option trader and, uh, you know, start watching uh, three or four YouTube videos and are like, okay, now I'm going to be an option trader, make my fame and fortune here. Uh, it doesn't really work like that. Option trading requires work. Uh, and that is a challenge. But when I see familiar faces here, like Jesus, who uh, comes by quite often, and who else do we have here? Who's who, who's not first time as this? Who's been in one of our other presentations here uh, with First Trade with me? <clears throat> yeah, Jesus. Hey, Joe. Yeah. What's up, my friend? I didn't know you were in here. Uh, who else? Anybody else? This is uh, you're a repeat um, viewer of my trainings here. Hey, Dominic, there you go, my friend. What's up, man? Who else? Uh, we got a few, a couple of names that I think I recognize here. Okay. So that being said, um. It, it, it does take a little bit of work and you know that otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? You're here to learn, not just to grasp one little trick and, and then magically you're going to be an option trader. You're here to, to get that knowledge. But then even with the best forecasting techniques, the best skill at being able to play the statistical game and take money out of the market with all the options education in the world, we're still going to make mistakes time to time, aren't we? And when I say time to time, like sometimes they are just that, time to time, like a one-time mistake. Like, oh, hit send. Whoops. Shoot, that was supposed to be a sell, not a buy. Oh, how many times have you done that? Probably not too many, but if you've made 100 trades, you've done that before kind of stinks is probably one of your earlier ones twice yeah <laughs> i know i i i get it it's uh it's a silly silly mistake but we do it because we're all human right uh and then but and and those mistakes are no big deal it's just a nice little push a nice little reminder oh crap i gotta be a little bit more careful next time you you have those mistakes you learn from them maybe you do make them twice Probably, Catherine, it'll happen again at some point in the future. Hopefully, that'll be the last one. It won't be for six months when your head's just not in the game for some reason. But those mistakes are no big deal. They happen once or twice or three times. The important ones are those recurring mistakes. And those come from either not having enough training, education, or experience. And so while most of my trainings here with First Trade are trainings, they're education, this one largely I'm sharing experience. And man, that is something valuable because it, they say it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert on something. But if you can leverage somebody else's 10,000 hours, you can get there so much faster with so much less time spent, which means so much less cost spent, whether that's in classes or in silly one-time or recurring mistakes, stuff that it takes you over and over and over to learn on your own through experience or through finding the education that teaches you those things. Uh, recurring mistakes can be just so, so costly. Even if you don't lose money trading something with a, a flawed premise, if you don't make money, like money gets compounded over time. That's the whole concept of trading and investing. You make some now and then you have more to trade bigger with in the future and it grows and it snowballs. It's compounding. 
if you stay stagnant for a year because you don't have that education yet, you, 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 you don't have that experience yet, you can't figure out why this thing is not working as it's supposed to just yet. That doesn't just take longer to get there. It takes exponentially longer to get there. You can't compound. You can't grow. Hold you back much more than you think. And these mistakes add up. <clears throat> I mean, look. If you lose a hundred bucks on a trade because you did it wrong, there's this one thing that you didn't learn yet. Instead of making two hundred bucks, I mean that's the difference of three hundred bucks. Like we can't just look at a loser and if it works best if I do the app, it works best if I do the opposite of what I think. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I get it, I get it. But we'll get you to be able to flip flop that and and uh, really focus. So, yeah, I mean, having a loser, like you got to think if this wasn't a loser, it would have been a winner. So, any amount of money you have, like you or that that you lose, like you can double that and say, like, this is what I actually lost. Not only did I have a loser, I didn't have a winner. And again, trading is a statistical endeavor. It's not like you're going to win on all your trades. Even the best traders don't win on all their trades. Some of the best traders win on only half their trades, but they have good money management skills and, and good trading management. Um, the difference between a good year and a bad year can be one little flawed piece of knowledge that you either think you know, but it's not true or don't know yet because you haven't learned it yet. Uh, that can be the difference between a good year and a bad year. And look, successful traders, like a good year, if you're well capitalized and well educated and put in the effort, a good year can be a good year. People make a living being doing nothing but trading options. And a lot of people who have bad years, they don't have a lot of bad years trading. People have good years trading options. They can have a lot of good years as a career for the rest of their lives. People who have bad years trading options, they don't have a lot of bad years. They just have like best case scenario, they have a few kind of bad years and just get bled dry and quit. Worst case scenario, you have a massively bad year from some really big mistakes and quit. <clears throat> I hate to see people feel they need to quit trading options. So we're going to talk about everything we need to, to transform you from bad years to good years. Because again, just like the difference between a winner and a loser, you lose 20 grand this year or you make 50 grand this year. It's a big swing. The difference between ultimate success and ultimate failure <clears throat> comes from where? Here, right? From within. That's the beautiful thing and could be the scary thing about being an option trader is that you, you decide to do it because you want to be in charge of your financial freedom. You want to be in control. You don't want to be at the mercy of the market or your boss or, the, you know, government policies. You, you don't want other people to control your life. You want to control it. That's the ultimate freedom. But you know what? If you're going to be the one in control, you better, if you're the one driving the car, you better know how to drive. So. Let's talk about some common trader mistakes. We've got all of these to talk about. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but it's some of the big ones that I've seen. One is choosing the wrong expiration cycle. Oh my goodness, this is a big one. Uh, and not even the biggest one, but it is a big one. This can lead you from having a 
bad year to having a great year. <clears throat> so when it comes to options, you log into your first trade platform, you pull up the option chain and you see across the top, there's a bunch of different expirations to choose from. Some just have monthly expirations, some have weekly expirations. Um, some of the ETFs have quarterlies in addition to monthly and weekly. A lot of them have leaps options, which are long-term equity anticipation securities. <clears throat> which one do you choose? Is there a right answer to which expiration to choose? Well, it turns out that there kind of is. And we're going to do some case studies today. So let's talk about a trader that I know named Larry. And we're changing the names to protect the innocent and the guilty. All right. But I'll tell you what. I, I've come across about 500 Larry's in my 30 years in this business, probably 500 Larry's just in the uh, 16 years that I've had market taker mentoring training traders across the globe. So Larry is an income trader, which we've done a class on income trading here with first trade, haven't we? <clears throat> that's basically option selling strategies so that you can make money on time passing as long as the stock cooperates and doesn't move dreadfully against you. And so one popular strategy with income trades is the credit spread. So Larry probably trades a lot of credit spread. <clears throat> so Larry's looking at a chart and he sees, oh, wow, this stock has been in this pretty broad range for a long period of time. I could sell these options at this expiration. But if I sell a longer term expiration, I can get more for these options. And in fact, I can sell further away from the stock price, a more out of the money call or put for my short strike and give myself so much more wiggle room. And holy cow. The stock hasn't busted above that price or below that price in two years. This looks like a pretty solid trade. I'm going to do this five month one, sell way out of the money, get a bigger premium. Sounds like a smart idea, right? Could there be a problem with this? Well, yeah. The whole point with income trades, which is credit spreads and time spreads, <coughs> wing spreads like I in cotton or butterflies is that you make money on time passing on time decay but the more time until expiration the more slowly those options decay <clears throat> the best way to think about credit spreads and time spreads and iron condors and such is that you basically get paid a little bit every day to endure risk, the risk of too big of a move. It's like rent. Uh, <laughs> you're getting paid rent and the building that you're renting out is a frat house. Uh, is this the month that it's gonna get completely trashed? I don't know, but I've got an income coming in until it does. Hopefully, you know, they move out, they graduate, become sophomores or juniors or seniors or whatever, and don't trash it this year. And, you know, that class expires and, and I got all the rent for the year. <clears throat> That's kind of what income trading is. And so what we, we might plan on having said income trade on for five months but we don't necessarily have to sell a five month option. We can have a more of a month to month lease where if it doesn't work out and they're being too rowdy, we just kick their butts out. So we wanna get a big enough rent. We wanna get a big enough theta, which is how we measure time decay. Theta is the daily amount of time decay that we profit from. <clears throat> to compensate for our risk. 
to compensate for the frat boys trash in the house. So Larry's trade was kind of flawed here in that because the theta or the time decay is very small for five month options, he's leaving a lot of money on the table with his winners and he could have done so much better instead selling a series of short-term options. <clears throat> For example, in this option, we could have sold an 11 day call, 175 strike call. The stock was at like 168 or something. Could have sold the 175 strike call that expires in 11 days at $1.82. And maybe we think it's not going to go above 175 for like a long time, like four months or something. Okay, we could still do this. Or we could sell one of those four month options, 122 day option for $12.65. Now in the same strike. Now on the surface, it looks like, well, why wouldn't I want $12.65? Why would I want $1.82? I make so much more selling the 122 day one at 1265 than I do selling the 11 day one at 182, but that's not actually true. There are 11, 11 day periods in 122 days. So if every 11 days I rolled, now don't get me wrong, like expiration days and every 11 days, there's a little bit of a mathematical fudge factor here, but I just took the screenshot yesterday. The concept's the same. If I just sold 11 day options or seven day options or 14 day options instead, and then rolled them every seven or 11 or 14 days or whatever it is, you know, if I had these, if I sold 11, 11 day options in a row at $1.82, I'd make $20 and two cents instead of 11, 11 day options, you know, in one contract, 122 day option, I only make $12 and 65 cents. I actually make more selling a series of shorter term options instead of one longer term option. And there's way more benefits to that as well. One really profound benefit is like, well, what if it starts creeping up getting uh, to a new all-time high looks like it might go above 175. Well, if this expires in 11 days, I could roll that up to 177 and a half or 180. If this is a 122 day option, I'm married to the darn thing. Sure, I can do adjustments, but that's going to require locking in a loss on the one I did. Here, I can do adjustments by just doing a new strike each time uh, while maybe keeping a profit. I'm the one that I traded. <clears throat> uh, other criteria, buying more time. If I'm buying options, I have decay that goes against me. I would rather buy longer term options because they decay at a slower rate, but sell shorter term options because the shorter term options decay at a faster rate. <clears throat> Whether I'm buying or selling, helps me choose which expiration is more suitable for me, which one will make me more money. I need to take into account the time horizon of the forecast as well. Okay, sure. I plan on holding this for four months. Yes. But can I do it in, you know, one, one or two week options at a time for four months? Or do I trade four months? Maybe if I'm buying the option, well, first of all, if I'm buying the option with a four-month time horizon, I actually have to buy longer than a four-month option because <clears throat> in four months, a four-month option will have no extrinsic value, no time value left. It'll just be intrinsic value. I would rather it have some time value. So if I have a four-month um, expected hold of a trade, and I'm and I'm buying options, I'm probably gonna buy like a six month option so that there's some residual time value that I can sell and, and collect upon and make money on. Uh, also, liquid expiration dates. 
I do a great deal with earnings trading. That is one of the things, one of the primary things that we teach at Market Taker. Actually, next month, we're doing a training on earnings uh, right before earnings season kicks off. And I'll tell you what, the expirations that I choose for my earnings trades, <clears throat> I'm used to, even if an option has weeklies and about 95% of the earnings trades I make do have weekly options, I'm usually buying the option that settles in the monthly expiration. Why? Because they just have more volume and open interest. Um, they're, they're, they have tighter bid ask spreads. I'm more able to middle the markets. I get better execution prices. I can get in and out of it more easily. All these things are just synonyms and explanations for what we call liquidity. And then longer term trades have less certainty, right? <clears throat> if I'm looking at a stock and uh, there's resistance at 100, right now it's at 80. If I'm looking at a one day trade, well, there's a pretty good chance it's not going over 100, rising 25% in a day. But if it's two year trade, I don't know, it could rise 25% in two years. That's nothing crazy. Okay, how about choosing the wrong strike price? That's a big deal too. You log into your first trade account and you see, oh my goodness, look at all these different strike prices. How am I going to choose which one, let alone all the expirations? But like, I want to buy some calls. Do I buy the in the money, the at the money, the out of the money? There's a different answer depending on different things. Is there a right answer? There is a right. I mean, th there are several right answers. It depends on the situation. Let's take Brenda. She's a directional trader. <clears throat> and what she likes to do is just buy calls or puts. She's looking for a slow, she's looking at a, a stock <clears throat> that's experienced a nice, slow, steady uptrend over three months, doesn't think that anything's going to change. And so she wants to capitalize on the stock continuing its slow, steady uptrend. So she buys a far out of the money cheap call because then she can get some leverage, right? And or she can risk less, right? Could there be a problem with this? Well, there could be. So Brenda's rationale was that the calls would profit if the stock rose, but far out of the money calls, A, they have small deltas, which is another way of saying they don't move as much as the stock price changes. Stock goes up a dollar, the calls go up just a little bit. For a longer period of time, the time decay, even if the time decay is low, it slowly eats away your directional profits. For those of you who are uh, people who are into the Greeks, which was incidentally my first book, Trading Option Greeks, um, like the one thing that you should know is that with directional trades, like buying a call, it's always a balance of expected delta profits versus known theta losses. We look at those as two completely different unrelated numbers. They're unrelated in that one measures only the directional profit or loss, one measures only the time passing profit or loss. But we have to balance them against one another. Also, with an out of the money call like that, there's a high break even price if Brenda was to hold it all the way until expiration. So her trade was pretty flawed. She could actually be right and still lose. So like, look, maybe, and even for a shorter period of time too, <clears throat> maybe Brenda's looking at Apple here and she's expecting the uh, Apple to rise to 220 bucks over the next 10 days. So she buys a just slightly out of the money call, $3.60 call, and plans on holding it for 10 days. Well, what happens? If she's right and the Apple does go to 220 and is trading, let's say at 220 and one cent 10 days from now at expiration, what happens? Well, did you ever learn how to calculate the break evens on these profit and loss diagrams? It's the strike price. The break even is the call strike price plus the call premium. So 217.50 plus 360 
<laughs> is 221.10. The stock would have to get above 221.10 to break even. Now, don't get me wrong. If the stock jumped up to 220 tomorrow, then there wouldn't be as much time decay. There would still be some time premium left. There wouldn't be as much theta damage, but there would be just as much delta profit. So choosing the right strike, it kind of goes hand in hand with choosing the right expiration. We need to look at the delta. Now, do we have to have the exact delta number? If you don't have access to that information, that's okay. Just use the rules of thumb. Out of the money options have small deltas. They move just a little bit. It, if the stock moves up a dollar, those out of the money options might move up 20 or 30 cents. And in the money option, they have much bigger deltas, above 50%. <clears throat> the stock moves up a dollar and in the money option might move up 70 or 80 cents. We should look at the break even. Now, I never like to hold options all the way until expiration, especially long options, because all the time decay gets expired by then. But I still like to look at the break even anyway, just in case. Worst case scenario, where does the stock really need to be above? That's really what my target is. Uh, the magnitude of the move forecasted. If I'm going to be buying, I mean, like, look, if we're looking for a very slow, steady climb over a period of time, you're better off trading in the money options. 65, 70, 80, 85 delta options. They move more in step with the stock and they have lower time decay. If we're looking for a big massive move, you're way better with out of the money options because you're risking much less. That's a, that's a less certain scenario, more risky scenario, expecting a big violent move. They don't happen as often, right? Think of a log normal distribution. So we want to risk less, but if the move happens, that out of the money call will become an in the money call very quickly and easily. <clears throat> also, the bid ask with. The most liquid options are at the money options. When we start getting into in the money options, the deeper you go, the wider the bid ask spread in a lot of stocks. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So we need to consider liquidity. <clears throat> How about this one? This might be the biggest killer of any option trader there has ever been <clears throat> and uh we got a question here will this session be recorded and divulged to first trade customers by email yes you will be divulged upon uh i don't know if they send you an email um if anybody from first trade is listening here uh maybe they can let you know but i highly encourage you to kick around in first trade and, and look for some of those archive presentations because they do record these. <clears throat> but if you can, stick around till the end. You never know if something I say today might be really useful to your trading tomorrow. Holding on to losing trades too long. This is the biggest killer. All traders have losing trades time to time. I know there's a YouTube video or two out out there or there's some bozo with like animated dollar bills flying around and he's acting all crazy saying he's never had a losing trade in his life he cracked the code figured out the secret found the holy grail but it's a bunch of baloney isn't it that's how trading works it's it's a you're gonna have winners you're gonna have losers <clears throat> you want to maximize your percentage of winners and even outside of that you want to have your winners be bigger and your losers be smaller. Now, depending on what kind of strategy you trade, there's a balance of, among all that stuff. But So to that point, there are a lot of traders who have a high percentage of losers and still make money. How? It's about trade management. It's about cutting your losses short. Let's take Charlie. <clears throat> so Charlie buys calls. He's a very simple, straightforward option trader. <clears throat> I would argue probably doesn't take advantage of all the nuances of options that can help give you an edge. But 
that's where Charlie is in his trading career. Um, maybe Charlie is good with charting and directional trades is his thing. So that's what Charlie does. Charlie likes the limited risk of long options, tends to hold long calls all the way till expiration to give them time to expire, you know, time to see the thing play out. But because of that, somehow or another, and maybe he's not sure why, he often loses 100% on his trades. Well, is there a problem? Yeah, I mean, if you're often losing 100% on your trades, I think there is a problem. Let's talk about it. Charlie's rationale, rightfully so, was that he'll win some and lose some, and hopefully the winners beat the losers. Now, hopefully is a big problem. There is no hope in option trading. There's planning in option trading. <clears throat> so Charlie didn't consider that he really has more control over his losers than this passive management. Buy the call, hope it works out by expiration. His process is really fundamentally flawed. So what Charlie can do instead is, I mean, we already talked about choosing the right expiration to give enough time and choosing the right strike price. But once you get those things mastered, then it becomes the trade management. If Charlie buys these two 17 and a half calls, thinking that, hey, you know, maybe Charlie's got it down pat. He sees it's 10 days to expiration, but his forecast is maybe for, you know, the rest of this week four days until expiration. So he smartly buys a little bit of extra time, <clears throat> which will lower his theta and not leave him completely barren of time value when he's closing the trade, doing all the right things, buying uh, just out of the money call because he's looking for a pretty good size move, not a massive explosion, but not just hoping it gets to 220, probably looking for like 225 or something. <clears throat> so he, he's doing all those things right. But he's got to get the management part right. He knows that he's going to have some losers and some winners because he's seen that and he's smart enough to realize that that's how the options trading game works. Any trading or investing game works. Warren Buffett, invest, he's like apparently the smartest investor that is alive now, maybe ever lived. And he takes a lot of heat on investments uh, until they play out. You look at his the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio, I guarantee you're going to see some assets that are losers. He's not crying about it. <clears throat> Nobody's teasing him saying, oh, you're stupid. You don't know what you're doing because you have a trade that's underwater right now. This is how the trading game works. So we need to prepare for that. We need to have a plan for that. So as soon as I put on a trade, the first thing that I do is I set a profit target and I put it in, And but I also set a, a loss target. If I'm making a trade like buying calls, like a purely directional trade, I will put in a stop loss. <clears throat> if I bought this at 360, you know, maybe I'll put in a stop to sell it at three bucks if it goes against me under where it is now, assuming that if, I'm wrong. I don't want to end up with 100% loss. I, I would agree to a smaller loss. And then my winners, I will have them set them to be bigger prop targets. If I'm willing to lose 60 cents, I'm probably looking to make a dollar, a dollar 20. <clears throat> so I can put in a GT90 order, which is good till 90 days from now, or until I cancel it, or until it fills. And I can automate cutting my losses short and just let that loss in. GTC means good till, or GT90 means good till 90 days from now. I put in that stop loss today and it's still there tomorrow. It's still there the next day. It's still there until 90 days later. <clears throat> Whether limited or unlimited loss potential on a trade, we should always try and mitigate losses. Because, you know, people who sell naked or even cash secured puts, Am I not, somebody said I'm not sharing my screen? Is that true? 
Can you see my screen right now? Where it says cutting losses? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. All right. That was kind of weird. Um, <clears throat> okay. So that being said, um, back to business. You know, if I'm selling naked or cash cured puts, well, it's not really technically unlimited loss, but I'll tell you what, if the stock goes to zero, it's going to feel like unlimited loss. I'll tell you that. Now, you can't always cut your losses, at least using a stop loss, because if the stock gaps overnight, the stop loss doesn't help you. So sometimes we can't use them, and instead, we just plan trades that have limited loss. We do spreads instead sometimes. Okay, talked about taking losses. We'd rather take profits, but if you take them too soon, that could be a bad thing. There's kind of a fallacy when it comes to option trading that nobody ever went broke taking a profit. Well, to make money in the long run, traders must have a, some combination of, like I said before, either more winners than losers or bigger winners than losers, or maybe both. Some combination. I mean, there are some traders like straddle traders who will have any straddle trader will have more losers than winners, but the winners can be a lot bigger. <clears throat> Any iron condor trader, income trader is, unless you're doing it dreadfully wrong, you're going to have more winners than losers, but your winners are smaller. So you really have to make sure you don't have big <laughs> losers. So a trader, Sasha, is a very high percentage of winners, but is down money for the year. Is there a problem? Well, yeah, that does sound like a problem, doesn't it? Because with some strategies, just a couple of losers can wipe out many, many winners, especially with income trading. Knowing that all traders have losers that draw down the account, Sasha must have aggregate winners that more than make up for the losers. <clears throat> so in a, this kind of complements the last uh, mistake that we talked about, cutting losses, managing losses, we also have to manage our winners and be very decisive about it. So, okay, maybe the same Apple calls, sure, okay, buy the two 17 and a half calls at 350. Um, I'm gonna look for the stock to go to 222, 225 over the next five days or something like that. Fairly realistic profit or a profit target. Well, as soon as I enter that trade and buy it and the trade is in my account, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm putting in my, my uh, limit order to take a profit, my profit target. <clears throat> so I'll set a limit price, you know, maybe that's $4.50, $4.85. And I'll put that in GT90 again, good till 90 days from now. And especially if you have a busy schedule. I mean, look, if you're sitting in front of your computer and you have your trading plan written out, you know where you're going to get out of this ahead of time. Because don't get, like, make no mistake, if you're like waiting until you're in the heat of the moment, when you have a lot of emotions going to make your decisions, you're always going to make the worst decision. You always have to have this planned before, um, before the heat of the moment. So a great way to do it, just put in a limit order. Hey, I'm going to sell this when the options get up to 450. GT90, which means it's good till 90 days. But there's only 10 days till expiration. So when it expires, it, it's gone. Just put it in and set it and forget it. Especially if you have a busy schedule, you got to work. You know, you're doing surgery during the day or you're working out in the field during the day. You can't be on your uh, trading platform all the time. Perfect way to manage risk. Okay. Mm -hmm. A couple of market taker mentoring trips, tips. Be greedy on long outright options. We want to look for at least a 50% profit target, maybe 100% or more profit target. And take the most of max profit on credit spreads and iron condors. Shoot for, oh, I would say anywhere from 60 to 75% of the max profit target. <clears throat> Don't hold those to expiration because at some point, um, the risk reward's not going to be there anymore. If you sell it at a dollar fifty, and now you can buy the credit spread back at five cents, take the lion's share of the profit and move on to a better trade where you can make more than five more cents. 
Is it possible to email questions in advance of an upcoming event? Yeah, yeah. Just go to markettaker.com, like I suggested earlier. Uh, here, I'll type the answer. Markettaker.com. <clears throat> and um, join our chat room and DM me in the chat room. Uh, Catherine asked earlier, good till cancel stop losses worked well for me with shares, but now with options because of the higher volatility and the bid ask spreads. I switched to managing options only manually. Your thoughts? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. So there's a couple of things. The higher volatility, um, the higher volatility, yes and no. I mean, overnight gaps is a thing, which is why I'm doing a training on zero DTE options next week because they eliminate the risk of overnight gaps. Better hedge than gold for sure. Um, so I don't know if volatility is a thing, but the bid ask spread is a big thing. So there's a couple solutions there. One is only trade options that have tight bid ask spreads so that you are able to manage them effectively. <clears throat> but sometimes you really want to make a trade in one that has a wider bid ask spread. So what you can do then too is manually or automatically monitor the stock. If you if you have the ability to set an alert, like, hey, I sold the 100, 105 call credit spread. I want an alert that says, if this stock gets at or above 100, send me an alert so I can close this. Because especially stop losses with spreads, I don't use stop losses on spreads. Um, and, and if you don't have the ability, like you don't have access to some sort of platform program that will send you an alert. There's there's a bunch of free ones out there. You you can find one. But, you know, you can also just check it three times a day. Oh, still below 100, all good. Oh, still below 100, all good. Uh-oh, we're at we're above 100. I got to close it. Um, How can we attend the Zero DT class? Just go to markettaker.com. Uh, and I'll type that in here again, markettaker.com. And um, <clears throat> when you click join free, that'll put you on our email list. And I'm going to email you a um, an invite to it. The invites are going to go out in just a couple of days. So now would be a good time. Oh, you're mostly trading spreads? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Okay. So cut your losses short. Let your profits run. This is a time-tested trader idiom. Uh, also, you don't want to hold your winners too long either. You got to look for that sweet spot. But if you have a plan going in, you say, I'm going to sell if it gets to this point, and you follow that plan, you're going to be miles ahead of 90% of the traders out there. And this all has to do with trading with the plan. Traders fail when they don't trade with the plan. There's two parts to every trade, getting in and getting out. We tend to talk a lot about and think too much about the getting in part of the trade that just sets if you have an edge on your trade, which is very important. But getting out is what determines if you actually make or lose money. Opening a position determines profit potential, loss potential, probability. Closing a trade determines if it's a winner or a loser. So let's say James. James is a one-on-one -on -one coaching student of mine. Again, change the name to protect the innocent and the guilty. He had a debit call spread trade and he was losing. And I asked, well, what, where are you going to take your loss? If I mean, it's gone against you. What was your plan for a loser? And he didn't have an answer. Didn't have a plan. Actually, James is what Hollywood calls a composite character because I have worked with a hundred Jameses in the past. This is one of the biggest killers of success for option traders is not having a plan. He typically exited winners and losers in the heat of the moment which is always based on emotion, which is always the worst way to base it. He was losing money when he came to me, but when, when I work with traders on their trading plan in one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, that, that's the turning point. That makes such a big difference. So a good plan starts with knowing the maximum profit potential and loss as well as the break even. I know if, hey, I'm buying these 432 and a half calls, what's the most I can lose? 
What's what I pay for it? $10.15. What's the most I can make? Unlimited prop potential on calls. If I end up holding this call to break even, which I won't do, but just in case, where does it have to get above? Well, remember, that's a strike price plus a stock price or plus the option price. So that would be uh, 432.65 is the break even. If I know that, I'm halfway there to my trading plan. Our best tips with Market Taker Mentoring, what we train our one-on-one coaching students, know your exits before entering into the trade. Set your profit target and your stop loss, both of them. If you can set them OCO, one cancels the other, do that. Write down your trading plan. You can write it on a piece of paper with a pen the old fashioned way, or I like to use Google Sheets for it. Plans can be simple or elaborate. It doesn't matter as long as you have one. Trading plans require dif- discipline though. It's not enough to have a plan. You need to stick with it. How about this? Using the wrong option strategy. Oh my gosh, this is a big one. Look, if you're new to options or experience, you, you know, you've heard people talk about, well, there's long calls, long in the money, long at the money, long out of the money, long term, short term. There's debit call spreads that are in the money, at the money, or out of the money. There's credit call spreads, credit put spreads, debit put spreads, iron condors, ratio vertical spreads, back spreads, straddles, strangles, butterflies, uh, broken wing butterflies. Which strategy should I use? Well, look, some are bullish, some are bearish, some are direction neutral, some are pro-volatility. We're going to start there, but even for bullish strategies, there's a bunch of them. It's easy for a trader to pick the wrong strategy. Let's say Bill. So Bill called me for help one day. He'd been losing money. One friend told him that the best stock to trade is Baidu. I haven't looked at Baidu stock in forever. Is Baidu even still around? I don't know. That's not one that hits my radar anymore, but I don't know why I'm using that as an example. It's a highly volatile stock. Bill's friend said, man, I've been making a ton of money in this stock. You should trade it. You should trade options on it too. A different friend said, man, I've been making a bunch of money on iron condors. So Bill figured, oh, your chocolate, my peanut butter. I'm going to trade iron condors on this volatile stock. Terrible idea. He didn't understand that he needs to match the strategy to the market opportunity. He traded a neutral oriented strategy on a volatile stock. The trade was close to his max loss one day, one day after he put on his trade. It's just a poor strategy selection. So what we need to do is we need to analyze the chart. That's always our first step. But then analyze the volatility. And we can do that in a very scientific way or just say, man, let's see. Over the past month or so, this has gone from, well, over the past two months, has gone from 92 and a half to 106.61. You know, that's 15% or something like that. Over 15% in a couple of months. That's a lot of volatility. And there's been a lot of ups and downs in the interim. There's a lot of volatility. Let's start there. Probably not doing an income trade, or at least definitely not something like an iron condor. We're going to research the news. Is earnings coming out tomorrow? Or we're probably not going to make any trade if earnings is coming out, unless it's an earnings trade like we we teach. Uh, What gives me the maximum probability of success and the optimal risk reward? If I'm putting on a bullish strategy on something like this, I probably want a long call instead of a debit call spread because I want it to have as much room to run as possible and not limit my profit potential. So let the market tell you what to trade. That's a seems like a weird thing to say and a weird thing to hear. <clears throat> but when you look at all the different criteria that goes into a trade, the market tells you which strategy is optimal. Here's a good tip we teach our students at Market Taker. Find three ways to trade an opportunity and pick the best one. Even if, even if you're just kind of guessing, taking a stab at it, Say, well, I don't know. I'm bullish. I know I could buy an in the money call. I know I can buy an out of the money call. I know I could buy a debit call spread. I don't know which is best, but let's let's look at them. Let's model them out. Let's think about what the most I can lose, most I can make is, likelihood of success is, where's my break even? 
think about things like, you know, how much could I make on direction, delta, versus how much will I lose on time decay the longer I hold it. And you can be scientific about that and look at the actual Greeks or just, you know, just think it through subjectively. So you don't have to be some sort of expert in knowing all these things, but if you think about three different ways to trade it, you'll end up picking the best one more times than not. How about this one? Misallocation of capital. This is a big one too. Position sizing is paramount to trader success. Trading too big or too small, over trading or under trading can thwart a trader's efforts. So trader Javier started with a $20,000 account. Javier wanted to grow that account fast. So he took a couple trades that he really liked, looked like really strong candidates, put them on really big. What's the problem? Well, when you're that aggressive, which can be okay sometimes if you do it right, but if you put all your eggs in one basket and one gigantic trade on, you can be way over leveraged and options are already a leveraged instrument in most cases, you know, you can end up blowing up that $20,000 account. Oh, well, I just lost 16 grand. I lost 80%. Whoopsie. So how, how do you better manage this problem? Well, my best tips from market taker are always keep 20 to 50% of your cash and reserves. When you trade options, it is by definition on margin. Every single trade is a margin trade. You might not realize that. You might think, oh, well, I'm buying a call for two bucks. Uh, it's a one lot that's $200. So yeah, I'm just paying $200. That's my risk. Well, that, that's true. But your first trade is going to consider that your margin. If I'm doing a credit spread, the margin is the most I can lose. If I'm doing a debit spread, it's what I pay for it. If I'm doing a butterfly, it's the most I can lose. If I'm doing a cash secured put, if that varies per broker. Check with your broker. A lot of brokers, it's 20% of the strike price is what you have to put up for margin. <clears throat> your amount of cash reserves should be based on your risk tolerance, your experience, and the strategy you're trading. If you're brand new to options, you've got a $20,000 account, you know, you shouldn't go and be buying a 50 lot of calls on something with, and, and spending $10,000 on it. Like, that doesn't make sense. If you're a very, very conservative person, you'd prefer to grind out profits slowly over time uh, rather than somebody who's willing to take a little bit more risk to be a little bit more aggressive. It's okay to lose more because I think I'll make more. That's okay too. That's called risk tolerance the amount of cash reserves is partially based on that. If you're brand new to trading, you should be trading tiny, tiny trades and have most things in cash until you get your sea legs. Uh, diversify your option trades. If all your trades are long call trades, I'm gonna tell you something, you're doing it wrong. You're not taking full advantage of what, of the nuances of option trading that you can use to get an edge, first of all. And second of all, the market doesn't always go up. The whole point of options is that you can make money if the market goes up, if it goes down, if it just trades sideways is really boring, or if it's really, really volatile. You can make money in all of those cases. Why limit yourself and have all your eggs in one basket, even if you've got five different long call trades on, well, if the market goes down that day, you're probably going to lose money. So why not, even if you like trading from the bullish side, in your analysis, sometimes you're going to find a trade that you're analyzing and say, oh, geez, I thought this was going to be bullish, but no, this is a terrible bullish trade. I'm actually bearish on this trade. Well, you might have just found a good put buying opportunity or a good call credit spread opportunity or a good put debit spread opportunity. You want to mix them up a little bit. It's okay to be mostly long the market if that's your thing. Over time, you have a slight advantage doing it that way. But you don't want to just always have the one single exact trade on. And when you first start trading, maybe that's all you know is how to buy calls. Um, whenever you first start trading, you're only going to know one, one type of trade, but you want to quickly move into knowing how to do two things. 
if all you can do is swing a hammer, you're not going to make a good carpenter. You're going to want a screwdriver in the set. You're going to want to drill, you know, in your toolbox. You don't necessarily have to be a master of every single thing. You know, there's going to be some people who are much better at patching holes and putting up, uh, you know, um, what do they call that? Um, mudding drywall or whatever. Some people are better painters and that's fine and normal, but you have to be good at a few things, not just one. Trading too big can lead to leverage losses and trading too small can have too small of an impact on your bottom line and you're just, you know, swimming against the current. All right, I've got a couple of questions I'm gonna answer. Uh, was James hoping for the options to expire and keep the premium? Hoping no one would exercise it. I forgot who James was. Hold on a second here. <clears throat> James. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Debit call spread. Um, well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of mistakes you can make trading bull call spreads, debit call spreads. One is, you know, hoping for, I mean, this is a this was a bull call spread, I think I said, right? Debit call spread. So that's a bull call spread. So if you're going to hold that to expiration, it's got to be above both of the strikes so that you, you exercise your long and get assigned on your short and keep that profit. That's a tricky game. I always prefer to sell them before expiration so that you don't have to carry that risk all the way through. Um, yeah. Um, in one of your early set earlier sessions, oh, thank you for being a repeat viewer. Um in one of your early sessions, I came across that an option can be relatively costly or cheap at a moment in time. How do we know or identify before buying or selling that a given option is currently costly or cheaper now? Yeah, that's a volatility analysis. And, you know, there are some packages out there that will um, enable you to look at a volatility chart and really analyze it from a very scientific level. And I do that, you know, that's great. I encourage you to do that. But if you don't have that um, functionality available to you or you don't have that skill set yet, if you trade options on the same stock over and over again, like you've made 20 trades in Apple, you're going to start getting a feel like, geez, I'm selling this credit spread. I'm getting a lot more for it than usual. And it's just as far away from the money. Options are kind of more expensive now than they used to be. You know, you'll... You can look at it just that way, a, a, a more simplified, subjective version as well. What should be the biggest expectation with this rate cut tomorrow? Well, I actually, Jesus, wait, didn't you attend my session uh, last week? Because last week I, I did a whole hour session on um, trading the Fed announcement. Uh, and, and and it has changed a little bit since then. Oh, you had to leave too early? I mean, basically, and I'm going to look at it right now to give you the most timely information. <clears throat> the Fed funds contract at the CME group, they're pricing in a 65% chance of a 50 basis point cut. There's only a 35% chance of a 25 basis point cut. So I can't read minds. I don't know what the Fed is going to do and nobody does. Anybody who tells you that they do know is just plain lying to you. But here's here's what I think is gonna happen. If the Fed cuts 50 basis points, like is two thirds of traders believe that basically, <clears throat> basically, um, I think we just kind of keep going, like we'll probably rally a, a, a bit, but we might not. Um, but we probably will rally a bit, but then it's all about, the, the game continues. Okay, what's next? When do they cut again? Is it 25 or 50? And we just keep playing the same game we've been playing. Uh, if they only cut 25 points, it, I believe it's very, very likely that the market sells off because more people expect a bigger cut. And when things don't go according to expectations, the market moves and that would definitely set up for a bearish move. So... Put on your seatbelt tomorrow before the Fed announcement. Uh, it could be an interesting one. All right. That being said, uh, thanks for spending your time with me. I sure enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your day. Trade smart.